Good. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste, Aslam Alaikum. Good evening, good night, or good morning to all of you. Um, we are pleased to have you all in this meeting from all different time zones in the world. I'm Ashiria Anrud. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, my family is from Suriname, Suriname in the Caribbean. And right now I'm a third year student at Erasmus University and I'm majoring in economics, business and society. Um, today, this is the 178th edition of our Zoom public meeting. And we wish to sincerely thank all of you who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian diaspora global project. For 177 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday. In the past three years, eight months, and one week, we have featured over 752 presenters from all over the world speaking on 177 topics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum. It's being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, which is a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. Here's the thing, we want to improve these programs and take our gatherings to the next level. And for that, we need you. Um, your ideas, your time, and even your generous support in forms of suggestions, volunteering, or donations, it can all help um, make us um, this experience even more incredible. So for details about this, please contact Dr. Mahabir. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator this evening is Shalima Mohammed. She is the co-director of the Zoom platform, who is a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago, and she obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. Shalima, welcome. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Namaste and a very warm welcome to all of you. We are so pleased that you chose to join us. This public meeting will take the form of a panel discussion, followed by questions and comments from members of the audience. The entire program should last around two hours. This meeting is being recorded live and would be uploaded later on YouTube permanently for posterity. We are also being live streamed on the YouTube channel of the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. So a warm welcome to all our viewers on YouTube. To avoid intrusions from trolls, Raven Ram Singh, our IT manager has muted everyone. Speakers, please do not admit anyone, do not unmute anyone, and do not allow anyone to share your screen. We appreciate your cooperation. Our program today is part two, maintaining Indian identity as an ethnic minority. And we are featuring St. Lucia, South Africa, Jamaica, and Belize. Ethnic identity with its roots in shared tradition, history, origins, beliefs, practices and values plays a crucial role in shaping the lives of the Indian diaspora. Indianness or Indian identity transcends racial, religious and geographical boundaries and serve as a testament to the enduring nature of culture itself and its ability to adapt and flourish in diverse environments. Maintaining Indian identity as an ethnic minority in countries such as such in countries as diverse as Saint Lucia, South Africa, Jamaica, and Belize is a fascinating and multifaceted challenge. To what extent have the Indian diaspora communities in these countries, far away from ancestral India, preserved their Indian cultural heritage? What forms of adaptation occurred and what kind of resistance to the status quo was required to preserve Indian heritage? Let's hear from our speakers. And our first speaker tonight, to, tonight for her, today for us, is Amanda Vanderhelm. She was born in England but lived in St. Lucia during her youth. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in fine arts and humanities at the School of Arts and Humanities in the Royal College of Arts in London. Welcome, Amanda. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'll try to share my screen. Can you see that? Is that okay? Can you see? Yes, yes. Okay. If you want to put it into um, slideshow mode, that would be fine. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. Oops. Okay. So um, I've been researching my indo saint Lucian history since I was 19. Um, my journey started when 
we could understand why we had so many uh, Williams in our family, so many people with the same surname. Um, so both my, my parents were born in St. Lucia and they spoke Patois uh, Creole at home with me and my brother. And they were from the same community. So it was easy to ask a family for information. So today I'm going to be talking about Indian identity as an ethnic minority in UK and St. Lucia. So I, I stayed there in my teenage years, recording stories and learning from my grandfather. And um, so to understand our Indian identity, we need to explore the past and the pieces of information that we have and look at ways to connect with the past and what it means for the future. I used to struggle fitting in with Indian communities uh, with the language barrier and lack of knowledge of Indian culture. But now there is more awareness of Indo-Caribbean uh, history and access to the internet, which helps us connect to the wider community like we're doing today, right now. So I was very lucky. I, I, both of my parents were interested in to research family history and uh, they had a close relationship with elders. So here, um, there's a picture of me and my grandfather and also a picture of my father with his grandmother. So we, we listen to their stories and we try to ask the right questions to piece together the history. And we uncovered names in the family tree. So what we found out was that the surname that was used three generations uh, in, in the line was incorrect. The, as you can see, the spellings have changed over time. Uh, because they were spelt phonetically and they were influenced by uh, colonial rule. So at one point we had French colonial rule. So you can see Jagannath has changed over time as Jagannath. And we didn't know what the correct spellings were. And uh, if you go further up the tree where you see Jagannath, Chitoli, Ribeo, these uh, had the surname Kuli and it was to label them as the immigrants from India. And the importance of these Indian surnames, they, they refer to the location in India, the class and religion and culture and tradition. So, so much of this was lost and it takes a lot of time and money and dedication to search the archives and the local churches for, for information to find those pieces of identity. I know that 10 years ago, the St. Lucian government, they tried to start an initiative to correct the spellings of surnames, uh, to encourage the public to change their surnames to what it should be. But how can you when you don't know the correct spelling? Um, so me and my father, we, we tried our best to collect this information, but he passed away and I tried my best to continue the research. So here is a photo of the fire devastation in 1948. This is from the National Archives, where the archives were located in Castries, St. Lucia. So I kept reaching a dead end with family research and was told that they were destroyed in the fire. So I went to look for these photos, here, like, like you see here today, because I wanted to witness the loss and process that grief. So I gilded the photo with artwork in Sanskrit to say, the pieces of truth rest here, Om Shanti. So here are a list of the indo St. Lucian surnames in St. Lucia from the Indian Heritage Association. I thought I might share this in case you recognize any of the surnames because some of those, some of them might be related to Indians in other islands. Um, the last census that I could find with online was 2010, where it showed that the East Indian population was 2.2%, but this doesn't show whether this includes the mixed East Indian and African descent population. When I spoke to Keith Compton from the Indian Heritage Association, he believes it to be around 8% now. So here are some photographs from uh, the Indian Heritage Association where they celebrated Indian Arrival Day. This was before the pandemic. They tried to reenact the arrival and hide, hide a ship um, to, to, try and re, to try and engage with that history. 
I understand that there is another organization called the Indian Cultural Foundation. Uh, I only uh, found out today, but uh, they also have been trying to raise awareness of um, Indian history. So here, I thought I'd include these quotes. So it includes, it's, it's a quote refers to the drafting of a legal document that gave the British power to transport Indians to St. Lucia. So Trinidad had an indentured system in place before St. Lucia and the Act of Trinidad, this legal document was used as a blueprint to draft the ordinance. So this draft was reviewed by Charles Canning who was the governor general of India. So as you can see, I've highlighted here, it says, but the case of St. Lucia is very different. Not only is the model act of Trinidad departed from, let's see here, but many of the provisions of that act designed to protect the immigrants are either omitted altogether or left favorably framed. No provision is made for the reception, lodging or feeding of the unemployed immigrant upon his first landing. No rule is laid down to guard against the separation of families in locating immigrants. And he goes on to say, in other colonies, he is at the end of five years free from industrial service without any payment. So there is a clear difference between the, the difference where, of the experience of the indentured labourer in St. Lucia and Trinidad, where the St. Lucian indentured labourer has to pay for his passage of return. Here are some photos of the only Hindu temple in St. Lucia. It was built on private land owned by High Priestess Anasadu and her family. So um, I was fortunate to meet her in April this year with my family. I'm not part of the organization, but I, I, I was just curious because it was the first temple on the island. Um, so she went to India to learn, to train to become a priest. And she became part of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And building her tem a temple on the land was her ambition to create a space for Indians to worship Indian gods. Um, so I have a video here show it. Um, of inside. You can see where the how the ceilings are painted. Uh, actually, uh, friends, friends from Trinidad, they helped to uh, decorate the temple. So unfortunately, she died uh, soon after we met with her in 2023, and it's unclear who is managing this temple. But uh, I thought I'd mention that although in the St. Lucia Constitution, it says that there is freedom of thought, of religion, um, Previously, Catholicism dominated rules on the island, and it was uh, it wasn't as diverse. So, the an example of this is when the church opposed civil marriage in 1876. These are photos from a ceremony honoring deceased deceased ancestors called Shraddha. So. Um, my grandfather used to tell me about this. It's a ceremony where uh, a hut is built and the departed soul is invited there and prayers and food are offered to help the soul of the ancestor. Uh, it's a very elaborate ceremony and that it brings the whole community together. Um, so this is one, one way of, of uh, honoring the ancestors, but, but through my research, I've also found another way, which is called tapana which is where you offer water to the ancestors and it can be done in the, in the comfort of your home. And I've also learned how to do puja at home in the UK. So as I, as I talked about Anna, um, she went to India to learn uh, how to do these rituals because there were gaps in knowledge and gaps in culture which result in some people joining religious organizations to feel part of a wider community and connect to the rituals that their ancestors participated in. So majority of indo St. Lucians are Christian and they have intermarried with the black community. So in the UK, there are many local temples given the diverse population. 
There's also a temple dedicated for the Caribbean Hindu community um, in London in Brixton. And I've been there myself. They're very, very welcoming. Um, and we also have online a Panchang, a Hindu calendar, which is one way to find out when the festivals are taking place and when they're happening during the year. So um, in the UK, we have a, a like a register where you can find out um, who is a registered priest because um, a lot of religious organizations are not regulated. So Indo-Caribbeans are vulnerable to exploitation. I've found that the Oxford Center of Hindu, Stud Hindu Studies have been very helpful. And I've, um, I've studied there, I've, had, I've studied some courses there to learn more about Hindu rituals. So after studying Sanskrit at Oxford Center of Hindu Studies, I thought I would create my own mantras. I started to, um, I, so one of the, the key themes in my research over 20 years has been searching for the truth. So I decentered English and in the center, you will see the transliteration of Sanskrit, which says aham satyam, sorry, aham satyaman vichami, which means I search the truth. And I've also put it alongside Kheol, which is Mukashashi Lavelte, which means I search the truth as well. So um, I've used the transliteration in the center because this was developed by uh, a group of British scholars in the 19th century who were trying to Romanize the, the Sanskrit script. And uh, it brings the past and the present together. So this is some of the work that I'm, I'm doing uh, with my research in the Royal College of Art. I think waves of migration and modernity have changed Indian culture today. How we choose to connect with that Indianness is subjective and personal. We can choose to be uh, traditional, but also take parts of that and into our lives. So here, what I've tried to do is show the past and how that is needed to understand the history and how that could be used in our present and future. We understand that indentured labourer, they, they, they went through a new system. It was a new system of slavery. They were malnourished. And when you know that history, in our present time, we need to use our voice when we witness injustice, exploitation, forced migration and cruelty and ensure that the future generations know this history. And also to remember our ancestors' strength and resilience. Because it's part of our DNA, they, they went through their sufferings and struggles so that we could live and have freedom. It's something that we should always remember. Uh, I recently, um, I, I heard a speech by Sir Hilary Beckles, and he talked about the plantation diet and how it's linked to health concerns today, like heart disease, high blood pressure and diabetes. So it's something to think about. And also the psychological impact, they were not seen, heard or understood. And in the um, uh, Protective Immigrants uh, Report in 1891, after 32 years of indentured labor, only four interpreters were on the island. So you can imagine they came over to a different country, they couldn't speak English, and there are only four interpreters there. You know, your voice is not heard. And this can present itself today as intergenerational trauma. So we need to prioritize mental health, well being, and healing. Uh, the social factor is that they are removed from their families and having to adapt to a new environment and culture. So we're being aware of our human rights and have critical thinking, decentering English as a language and deconstructing colonial ideologies is very important. One of the quotes that I got regarding education because education for indentured laborers was limited. I've got a quote here. Nothing has been done to enforce the clause of the Education Act. The scheme for the Canadian mission schools include religious teaching, which should not be forced on the children of Hindus and Muslims, 
The difficulty has been got over in Trinidad, where the religious teaching precedes the daily, the daily education, and nobody need attend who does not want to. So you can see a clear difference between St. Lucia and Trinidad, where uh, religious education is optional in Trinidad, which is, explains why there's so many gaps in culture. Um, and the lastly, spiritual. They went through ex existential suffering, trying to maintain the rituals of, rituals of importance. So it, it's really up to us how we choose to, um, how we choose our own rituals to connect with our Indian heritage and ancestors. I think uh, learning about our Indian, Indian identity helps us to understand ourselves better. It's part of our journey of self-discovery and helps us to recognize the strength and resilience that's in ourselves. So thank you for your attention and engaging with my presentation. Uh, Acknowledgements to Indian Heritage Association, uh, with Family, National Archives in St. Lucia and UK, and thanks to all these organizations here. I'll be uh, uh, doing a private display at Lloyds of London later this year, which is ironic because it's also the, the former place where the East India, um, East Indian, Indian, East India house was located. Um, so that will be interesting to do. Um, and I'm also be um, exhibiting my indo Lucian research at the Royal College of Art in 2025, and you're all welcome to come and see it. And here are my contact details. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was an extremely interesting um, presentation. So well done. And um, there's so much I want to say, and there's so many questions I have for you. But I'm seeing Albert with his hands up, and I'm going to give my preference to him. Go ahead, please, Albert. Albert? All right, we're good. Yes. Uh, Amanda, you are amazing. I <laughs> truly enjoyed listening to you. I'd like to hear another 15 minutes, but that's not my choice. So I will tell you what I'd like to, to ask of you. Our culture is 2,000, probably thousands of years old. And so what do we keep? And so because I'm an economist and applied economist, did you ever consider putting a category for the economic component yeah. of the, the folks, because I have a strong hypothesis that our people came over and our ancestors set the foundation. And I'm hoping that our Indian people in the Caribbean and wherever we are have done way better than the, the our grandparents did, or else why why did they come? But yeah. that's just a hypothesis. So if you could look at, you know, maybe you picked up some economic uh, knowledge along the way. Can you share? Um, well, yeah, they, I mean, they gave us the opportunity, you know, when they, when they travel to, to the Caribbean, you know, they worked so hard to, the aim was to, to buy land, you know, when you think about it, you know, the purchase land. Mm -hmm. And then once they had that land, it was, it was, a uh, you know, a way to, to escape indentorship, you know, and I think, um, that drive to have more you know, to have a better life, you know, that feeds through the generations, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my parents, they, they were born in St. Lucia and then they, they had the opportunity, you know, because St. Lucia was part of the Commonwealth to move to the UK. So, you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think the drive, you know, to, to have a better life is definitely there. Okay. Thank you. By the way, I like the concept of buying land. All my family and people love land. I don't know. It's in her DNA. I'll leave it at it's that. It's in the DNA. That's an that's intergenerational thing. <laughs> okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Jay, can we have your question, please? Are you able to unmute? Two comments and one question. Uh, the question first, uh, did you link the doctrine of discovery when the colonists went around the world colonizing and taking uh, people after slavery 
as indentured peer Indians. And secondly, you gave a good presentation in the sense that uh, you are the future. And I think you've got, you've got the handle on it. But not to forget that there were two categories. One, the indentured Indian that came in. And after the indentureship, they either went back to India or stayed on as uh, residents of whichever colony they were in. Then you talk about St. Lucia moving from Trinidad to St. Lucia. So that is immigration. There's no indentureship happening there. So the Indian communities that moved in that fashion uh, were either influenced by the uh, Catholic or Protestant religions, and they were converted and they moved. And you will find that common in the whole Caribbean and in, in Africa and in uh, you know, Asia, wherever there's Indians, the Catholic or the Protestant church using the uh, doctrine of discovery, like what they did uh, during slavery, is, uh, was used to convert the oh, Indians. Yeah. But our res resilience where uh, <clears throat> Albert talks about purchasing land, it's an old adage that when the time the Zamindars had their land and uh, communities, we always purchased land and land was valuable for us. And we used to give it in to bond for marriage or borrow money and so on. So that is a intrinsic of Indian culture. And that's what we carried all over the world. So well done. And uh, you know, on point, you are the future. Thank you. So we, thank you we hand it over to you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And others like you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there are definitely waves of waves of migration. Um, and there is a yeah, there is a, a, a deep history, you know. Because after slave, you know, uh, um I've been reading up on uh the Indian, the native Indians, you know, the yep. you know, the from that period. Of Canada, indigenous and people and then yeah, yeah. You know, slavery and yeah, I've, I've it's, it's waves, isn't it? Yeah, and, layers and, and layers. Yeah. That doctrine is the crucial part of colonizers, mm -hmm. right? From the Portuguese, the French, the Spanish, the uh, you know British, and so on. All these colonists and the Dutch also. So that was the weapon they used: religion, Christians, Catholics, and Protestants, and Baptists later, and then they moved down. Like Germany, you know, paid reparation to the uh, indigenous people of uh, Namibia already. They paid. Yeah. So it's coming down and you are the uh, inheritors to that reparation movement. Hopefully it comes down to the Indians. Thank you yeah, very much. Nice, yeah. interesting. Great, thank you, Jay. Let's take uh, Mr. Michael Thakur very quickly, please. Can you unmute? Yeah. I'm here anyway. Um, I I had a few quick comments. I I, I thought I I should just commend Amanda for her excellent presentation. There's a lot of spirituality in what in, in, at the core of what you you presented and I think that didn't go unmissed by me. Um, so I appreciate that because as, a, as an Indian uh, immigrant uh, um, um, descendant from, from the immigrants to Jamaica, there's not much more I have. I, I have a core of spirituality, which I, an appreciation for what these folks did back then and, and, a, and a deep weeping of their suffering that, yeah. that one's hum, humble and and one appreciates one's progress. So that I think is at the core of it. Um, I, I'm from George's Plains, so Mr. Battle, who might actually know me. I believe he's he's from, from Sav or somewhere there. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to just quickly say that um, um, the, in the 1943 census in Jamaica show that um, over those holders, farmers with hold, holdings of over four acres were primarily Indians. And that's a remarkable, significant um, economic um, indication of, of how well these folks did in terms of acquiring land after they arrived in the 1800s. So I just wanted to point it out. I also mm. would love to see some work that has been done. I haven't read enough yet. I've been reading quite a lot, but I haven't read enough yet to know if it has been done. But I'd love to see the extent to which these Indians who came either mitigated the, the decline of the sugar plantations in, in, in the post, post um, apprenticeship period in the 1800s to 1916. Um, in terms of um, the output of these, these plantations. Um, that work, I'd love to see because I think that that significant contribution that I believe was made either to mitigate the decline or to improve the output in some cases. In Jamaica, it was the more, I think, to mitigate the decline. Um, yeah, I'd love to see more interesting studies of that. And I, I certainly would love to, to look into that myself. So if others have information on that, I'd love to, to see. Thank you so much. Right. Okay, great. Thanks for that comment. Um, Lenroy Thomas, uh, originally of St. Vincent. Uh, we'll take your question quickly, please. Yeah, um, it's not a question, but a comment really. Um, there's some additional information. And to help Amanda. Nice presentation, Amanda. Yes, I'm from St. Vincent, I've been talking now, um, and I did some work in regards to the history of the Indians in St. Vincent. Um, I understand that the, um, the records were burnt in St. Lucia. Um, and um, St. Lucia and um, Mr. Cheddy Richards, he's the one who actually um, who first typed up all on the names from the Indian register in St. Vincent. I guess because he couldn't find those in St. Lucia. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so he's the one that you you probably could get in touch with Chaddy um, Richards. Also, there's James. Oh, Richard Rob Chaddy. Yes, Richard Chaddy. Yes. So you, you, okay, in touch with him. And then there's James Rambali. Um, he would tell you that there's some Indians who came to St. Lucia from St. Vincent during the mm. time of the volcanic eruption of 1902. I think mm. one of the relatives um, in the Bacchus family is over there. Uh, my uncle, Donald the Bacchus, said in 1965, he went to St. Lucia and uh, he met this lady who was uh, about 100 years old and it coincided with the family, our family in the um, Indian register. Um, mm -hmm. She was three years when she came to St. Vincent. So when we calculated, most likely it could be that person. And there are some Cadu Bacchus in your list there also that uh, is... Um, Common in the list in Simmons, so they may have gone with the same direction. There's some stories about that um, connection. Just wanted to say that. All the best. Oh, and um, mm -hmm. the records, um, I have, uh, we have found um, records in England. Um, the the gazettes in England has uh, the list of names of all of the students who went to St. Vincent. Maybe you can find records in the, at the National Archives. In yes, I've been working with them. Yes, I've been going through the archives myself. Okay, yeah. so there are copies up there also. All right, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Amanda, thanks once again. Excellent presentation. And I invite you to so look much. at the chat. There are a few questions and comments for you. Okay. Great, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to move on now to our second speaker. And this is Professor Subishini Moodley of South Africa. She teaches in the Nelson Mandela University. Her focus is on post-colonial feminist film as a tool for empowering women and challenging dominant gender representations. Welcome, Professor Mudli. You have 15 minutes. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening from South Africa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, just a few notes. I might cough <laughs> through my... Um, presentation at certain points. Uh, I think I have a slight cold coming on, so please excuse me if that happens. Um, and can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so, um, you know, the topic of maintaining um, 
Indian identity as an ethnic minority is a huge, huge area. And I've chosen to uh, approach it from my area of specialization and uh, my, my little uh, research project that I did. So this presentation is by no means exhaustive of maintaining um, a minority ethnic identity in South Africa, so um, in terms of the Indian community. Um, so just to keep that in mind. Uh, so I've titled my project, uh, sorry, my presentation, The Feeling of Being, Conceptualizing and Representing South African Indian Identity. Um, I just want to start with a very brief historical context. So in 1860, we had the first arrival of Indians in South Africa uh, at the shores of the East Coast um, in a province we now call KwaZulu-Natal. Back then it was called Natal, on a ship called Truro. And they came as endangered laborers to work on the sugar plantations. And there were several other groups that arrived later. Um, then just jumping ahead, the arrival of Gandhi in South Africa in 1893 and the establishment of the National Indian Congress in 1894 encouraged the fight against discrimination and poor uh, treatment of Indians in the country. And then later during the years of apartheid, the allyship of the NIC with the African National Con Congress um, led to, um, sorry, saw many Indians engaged in political activism against the dominant regime at the time. But Despite this, ethnic conflict between Indians and Black South Africans did occur, largely as a consequence of the national government's divide and rule approach, which saw, which saw Indians in certain instances receiving privileged treatment and opportunities, specifically in terms of education, employment, and business. And a lot of this coincided with uh, Mr. Naya's comment earlier about, you know, the second part of indenture where some people returned and some Indians remained and some of those that remained actually went into business and started building their own economic uh, power. Okay, uh, so that's just a very brief historical context. I now want to move on to what I refer to as redefining diaspora because this is something that came up in uh, quite strongly in my research. So even though my research focused specifically on South African Hindu women, one line of inquiry that we had to explore was redefining diaspora. Um, so yes, I just want to forefront um, one of the main issues that my uh, participants raised and it aligns with what Fatima Mir in 2003 um, Instead, when she was receiving the highest honor bestowed by the government of India to Indians abroad, uh, which is called the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas Award. In, and she is a well-known South African sociologist and political activist. And in her speech, she lamented the application of the term Indian diasporic to South African Indians. She said, the word diaspora seems to have become very firmly entrenched in designating ourselves or in referring to ourselves, but it is a word I abhor. I am certainly not a diaspora of India. We South African Indians have had to struggle hard to claim our South Africanness. We are not a diaspora of India in South Africa because we claim South Africa for our own and in order to entrench that claim. We had to struggle hard and alongside, uh, sorry, alongside our South African brothers and sisters. Our prime minister stated very clearly that we as Indians who settled outside India did not go there in any sense of colonialism or in any sense of wanting to possess something that was not ours, but rather to share and contribute. So what, um, just to reiterate what my study was about before uh, illustrating how that quote aligns with some of the issues raised by my participants. Um, the aim of the project, I completed a project with South African Hindu women. The aim of the project was to develop a, an approach to telling the stories of these women that challenged the dominant and limiting representations that they'd been subjected to via mainstream media. 
as I said, one of the lines of inquiry at the outset was the experience of the notion of diaspora. So while I am fourth generation Indian in South Africa, because my great grandfather arrived much later than the initial group, there were some members of my participant group who, who were between sixth to seventh generation. And I highlight this to reiterate the length of time that our families have been in the country. In discussion, they concurred with each other that they experienced representations of South African Indian identity as continuing to reflect characteristics that one would expect to find in earlier generations of diasporic movement. Okay, <clears throat> so how so? I asked them to explain what they meant. So they said, these representations were often plagued by uncertainty, confusion, and personal conflict. Negotiating what is referred to as the conflicted pull between desiring to belong to a host society and longing to maintain the cultural identity attached to the homeland. They also said it was characterized by what is perceived to be marginalization or rejections at the hands of the host red dominant culture, and as a result, finds itself clinging to cultural artifacts and practices that serve as reminders of home. And one of the major artifacts they kept bringing up was uh, Bollywood. They kept referring to Bollywood as this artifact or reminder of home. Uh, furthermore, they felt that a large portion of the community, uh, to a certain extent, still subscribes to and uncritically perpetuates these representations. Their confusion further emerged from why there hasn't been a greater shift in the construction of identity between the initial and contemporary generations of Indians in South Africa. And this, this confusion was further compounded by the contradiction between the community's imagined sense of diasporic unity and the actual complex diversity that they maintained within the community in terms of a variety of factors such as religious affiliation, language grouping, surnames, etc. So then the question that I posed to them was, why did they think so? Okay, why did they feel this way? And then they argued that, um, this, the, that this need for a sense of community distinct from the broader national social structures emerges from over a century of religious and ethnic displacement and separation that has been experienced within South Africa. So they were actually speaking of a dias of diasporic characteristics actually being experienced within the context of South Africa, which is interesting. My participants explained that while the initial arrival of Indians in South Africa saw the movement of people from one context to another or one country to another, which involved a process of geographical displacement that required people to acclimatize and become familiar with a new environment. Upon arrival, they were faced with further marginalization in terms of attempting to integrate into a different colonial society with a large population that had already been a, a large population of already colonized subjects. My participation's observations in this sense speak to what Ashish Nandi uh, refers to as two overarching concerns of colloquial, um, sorry, colonialism which are the physical conquest of territory, uh, territory and the conquest and occupation of minds, selves, and cultures. So, um, although the movement to South Africa was based on the promise of an improved economic status in the form of endangered labor, this contractual system within South Africa was historically oppressive and exploitative in nature, discouraging integration with other groups and augmenting existing levels of indeterminacy and uncertainty. The subsequent division and separation enforced by decades of apartheid regime served only to exacerbate the experience of deterritorialization and interstitiality. So the Indian community in South Africa has not so much as a result endured the physical conquest of territory. Um, uh, even though conquest is always at some level relevant to the subjects of an empire, as, mu as much as they experience a kind of double deterritorialization de uh, in the move from India to South Africa and subsequently along with other non-white race and ethnic groups in South Africa as a result of the forced removals and relocation policies of apartheid. So now we see why um, 
why the feeling of being diasporic continues in subsequent generations. Um, effectively, the South African Indian community, again, similar to other communities in South Africa, has suffered the conquest and occupation of minds, selves, and cultures through, through degradation, human rights injustices, limits on personal freedoms, and the denial of culture and heritage inflicted by dominant powers of the time. As such, the history of Indians in South Africa has therefore been marked by the continued effacing of identity, a legacy that is to be thought to be remedied by a return to all acknowledging of cultural difference and specificity by those who have suffered and their subsequent generations. Participants further identified, in addition to the political and social drivers that have contributed to the continued experience of diasporic displacement and marginalization among South African Indians, other factors such as religious and cultural practices and stories of the homeland that have been told to each subsequent generation of the initial Indian immigrants. These so stories seem to serve two primary pur purposes. The most obvious is to ensure the continued existence of the culture and religion in subsequent generations. And the less obvious is that these practices offer a form of comfort and security amidst a turbulent history. So what is this feeling of being I referred to in my title? It's actually, it's actually a final definition or, or a name or a label given to what these participants felt was going on in terms of maintaining an ethnic, my uh, ethnic, um, sorry, an identity as an ethnic my a minority. So the discussion of my participants thus led credence to the notion that the diasporic experience does not always have to be direct in order for the perception of displacement or marginalization to be present in subsequent generations. It would therefore be safe to contend that the conventional concept of diasporic consciousness be supplemented with a secondary notion of dias diaspora, what they refer to as a feeling of being diasporic. As such, often conflated with the di direct experience of diaspora, diasporic feeling of being can be understood as a secondary displaced consciousness, a consciousness that your existence occupies an ongoing space of lack and discomfort, even if the space is the only home that you or your immediate forebear, forebears have ever known. This consciousness emerges not so much out of learned behavior, but as an affective response to the experience of your context and history, and as a means of maintaining an awareness of past ethnic injustices, as well as a way of preserving a potentially problematic group identity. It is a consciousness that is inseparable from the South African Indian imaginary I, as well. It's the feeling of being diasporic. So why a feeling of being diasporic? One participant, when asked whether she considers, sorry, one participant, when asked whether she considers herself diasporic, responded with both a yes and a no. She explains that she viewed India and South Africa as two parents that she can't separate or choose between, even though India represents culture and religion, to whom she returns to for spiritual guidance. She maintains that South Africa is her home. She does acknowledge, however, that even though she may exhibit some similarities to women from both India and South Africa, she doesn't fit neatly into either context. She sees herself as a mixture of both. Another participant in a slightly different vein describes people of the Indian diaspora as sparks of light spread across the world. India, she explains, is the light source to which they all need to return for the restoration of spirituality and emotional energy. She explains in terms of her own troubled past that India is the place you return to when you feel isolated because you've either lost your faith or motivation to live. In the same breath, however, she explains that the multicultural nature of South African society is something that the South African Indian community should embrace together with their Indian heritage. A third participant, to a certain extent, concurs. Although she spent approximately four years studying dance in India in her early 20s by her own choice, she maintains that India is a nice holiday destination, but that return to South Africa should not be negotiable. 
She considers South Africa to be a microcosm of the world in terms of the various cultures and nationalities that have settled here. For this reason, there should be no desire to want to live anywhere else. This, however, is somewhat contradictory to her assertion that she considers herself Indian first. <clears throat> Even though the diasporic feeling of being at a certain level resembles characteristics of a direct, direct diasporic experience, its crucial difference emerges both from what I would describe as the notion of double return and a sense of loyalty to an Indian identity. In the case of the former, my participants' uh, responses allude not only to a return to India for guidance and meaning, but a return from India to South Africa thereafter. Interestingly, however, while they acknowledge their South Africanness and view South Africa as their home and argue that it is a privilege to be both Indian and South African, there appears to be a need to work at their identity. Doing identity work as such is proof of commitment to an Indian identity and is closely linked to the notion of loyalty. Dr. Moodley, please make yes. your closing comments. Sorry? Please make your closing comments. Thank you. Sure, I've got one paragraph and then I'll end. <laughs> Two possible explanations for this could be a perceived safety emerging from an imagined unity amongst Indian members, sorry, amongst members of the Indian community in response to an unfulfilled social integration into a South African context, or anxiety at the proposed prospect of a diluted or lost Indian identity emerging from a greater emphasis on professional integration into mainstream society. This is the nature of the conflict that characterizes the diasporic feeling of being and is perhaps more strongly associated um, with the Indian woman in the diaspora as a consequence of the taxing balance that they have to maintain between professional advancement and cultural commitment discussed earlier. Okay, I'll end there. I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I will invite you if you do have a question or a comment, for Professor Moodley, please raise your electronic hand and we will take that now. Of course, I just want to remind everyone, we have three speakers to come and uh, it's already 4 p.m. So let's please make those questions very short as well as your comments. Dr. Moodley, it was a very interesting um, bit of research that you would have done in South Africa. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Jay, go ahead, please. And again, please make it short. You are muted. Uh, just one question, Professor Modley. Uh, how would you regard yourself living in South Africa? Your ID, identity. Uh, sorry, can you... Oh. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. So I've always seen myself as South African of Indian descent. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy my, you know, my heritage and all the wonderful stuff that comes with it in the stories. And I'm very proud of that, but I've never known any other home besides South Africa. And so I feel I'm South African first, with this beautiful heritage of Correct. being in. Yes. Correct, thank you. Tell them where you're muted. You are muted, uh, Shalima. Dr. Shardanan, go ahead, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you now. Okay, I think a professor had uh, triggered my mind with uh, following, uh, 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 she calls it something like being, feeling being a diasporic, <laughs> person well i think that is a very core things 
for all of us. Because the Astorian of the Astoric person, I am the seventh generation here in Holland. How can they call me the Astorian? I am a Hindustani Dutchman. <laughs> Sarnami Dutchman. Understand? So yeah. what do you mean and why did you introduce this excellent issue? Can you explain that to me? So what had happened was we, I've always, you know, I've always watched Bollywood films and no offense to anybody who loves Bollywood films, but I've always felt so angered by how the women are represented in those films. And, you know, to a large extent, they're very popular in South Africa and people clung to them uh, as uh, forms of representations, as links to the motherland, India. And I always felt, but that's not us. That's not South African Indians. That's not what we do. That's not how we look. That's not how we dress. So, uh, and so I actually just wanted to explore what women, other Indian women felt. And I never told them what my feelings were. I just said, how do you feel about how you're represented? And then the issue of diaspora organically emerged. And they said, well, you know, I don't know why we, be, we keep, we are called the Indian diaspora. We've been here for so long. So I said, okay, let's let's explore that. Let's see why why you feel so uncomfortable with the term. And that's when all of these issues were raised. And we actually, I took a participatory autoethnographic ethnographic approach to the study. And so as a group, we discussed, we sort of thrashed out the issue. And that's when they said, well, actually, even though we weren't part of the initial group of people that came from India, there were all these other things happening within South Africa that combined with the stories of the initial, um, uh, you know, um, indentured laborers that were handed down to us. And they all come together to create the feeling of being diasporic. And that was the best term they could come up with at the time. So I stuck with it. I, I used that term, but I mean, you know, it's always a work in progress. So. Great, thank you so much. We'll take your next question from Mr. Manet Bujwala. Yeah. Mr. Bujwala. Yeah. Thank you very much for all the good research uh, you and other people are doing. Uh, I was wondering if you are aware of, uh, um, uh, there was a lady, Mrs. Rani Jinwala, who was a freedom fighter and who also was part of the government. Is she still yeah. active? No, she passed away. Passed away, okay, okay. Yes, right. yes she passed away. All right, thank you. Okay, Albert, yes, quickly. Unmute, please. Doctor, uh, I am very it's pleased with your presentation because it gives me the chance to reflect on who I am. And I'm in uh, many of these sessions, I've always said that I'm technically not a diaspora of Indian. I'm a Belizean Indian, but it does. we do have some characteristics that are 2000 plus years old and we need to blend the two together. So it's a yes or no kind of an answer. But my question to you as a scientist, and I'm one too, is the sample size is very important when we do research like this to figure out if that's the pulse of the P Indians of South Africa, or is that just a feeling of a few people? It could answer, it please. Is, it is the feeling of a few people. Because it was a uh, creative output practice-based research project, I couldn't work with a very large sample because mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching women how to make films. So yes, but I've continued to explore it in other ways at the um, I've got a current research project that I'm working on as well. So thank you. I'll have more data. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Moodley, I hope you continue and I hope you actually um, increase that sample size. We really would love to get here the findings. Fantastic yes. work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. All right. Bye. All right. Let's take our third speaker now. And this is Shani Bullock of Jamaica, no stranger to us. Uh, she's a retired lecturer at the Caribbean School of Architecture, and she's now indulging in her passions of traveling the globe, architectural anthropology, intercultural studies, heritage studies, and genealogy. Welcome, Shani. 
You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. Is everybody seeing and hearing me clearly? Yes, clearly. Thank you. Great. Who am I? Greetings, dear friends. Um, this presentation started off with a request to present on identity based on a conversation we had on the portrayal of Indians in the media. My response when asked if I present was maybe I'm not Indian enough. Then I sat down and thought maybe this is exactly why I should present. The question of identity is complex and emotionally linked, especially in the Caribbean, where most of us have lost our ancestral lines. My presentation revolves around the following. In order to maintain my identity, I first need to find it. I was born and raised on the island of Jamaica. Growing up, my father simply said that his folks came from India. I did not ask about his family and he talked of them in general terms, not ethnic terms. The only Indian thing that was consistent was food, such as curried goat, scotch bonnet peppers, um, eggplant, boiled jackfruit seeds cooked down in coconut milk. My father described having to parch his own spices to make curry powder, a task he did not enjoy and did not impart. The first set of Indians arrived in Jamaica on May 10, 1845. Over 36,000 Indian indentured laborers came to our shores. Although a fair number, it was a very small percentage of the total population, less than 5%. They were dispersed across the island in several plantations. As a result, they quickly assimilated into the general population and tried to keep a low profile. Visible remnants of culture were present in celebrations such as Hase, which was not seen as a religious event, but rather as a cultural event by Hindu, Muslim, and Christian Indians. The culture was also maintained through music and dance, most notably the Nachania or Frap dance, which is still found in Jamaica. Celebrations around Indian Arrival Day did not even start until 1995 when it was first known as Indian Heritage Day. Because of the low numbers, no pundits or imams were on hand to carry out rituals. Even though Hindu and Muslim marriages were held, non-Christian marriages were not officially recognized. It was not until 1956 that non-Christian unions were legally accepted. Most of the Indians were converted by the Anglican Church and some by the Roman Catholics. Here is an example of a Roman Catholic baptismal document. Note how many men were named Samuel Jackson Cooley. Imagine trying to find out which one was your ancestor. So where did the awareness of my Indian roots come from? In my teens, I started to explore world religions, especially the rituals of Hinduism and Islam. I visited both the Sanatam Dharma Mandir and the Sanatam in Kingston. The members of both were incredibly welcoming and offered much support and guidance. Thereafter, the doors of knowledge opened up. My uncle used to sing bhajans, but I had no idea what that was all about. It sounded sweet to my ears. I was explicably drawn to Indian music and Bollywood movies, and I soon joined the Indian Cultural Society in Jamaica. It was there that I really started to connect with India. They hosted many events and I participated in the dance and fashion shows. I even served on the committee for a few years. I had people who greatly influenced my journey. During my final year at University of the West in Lismona, my undergraduate thesis was Indian religious rituals in Jamaica. Vereen Shepherd, champion of all things Indian, was my supervisor. And at the time, I probably did not even know how special she was to our Indo-Jamaican community. I went into areas such as Bushy Park and Central Village, where I was able to interview several elders who still remembered the foundations of religious celebrations. With the help of Lakshmi and Ajay Man Singh, I started to embrace my heritage in a positive and affirmative light. They encouraged me to dance, to not be timid in showing that I had Indian blood running through me. 
Perhaps this was a turning point in terms of wholeheartedly exploring this part of my culture. Just after finishing my bachelor's, I went to teach in France. There, I met an Indian from Mauritius who was giving Bharata Natyam classes. I grabbed the opportunity to learn. On my return to Jamaica, I danced at King's House, the Governor General's residence, for the celebration of interreligious unity. I now look back and be amused as I had only mastered the Alaripu or beginner's dance, and that is what I danced with a friend. We only had a cassette recording and no fancy costumes. Thankfully, it was well received, and subsequently, I was invited to a Bhaktanath Yam workshop hosted by Mina Telekacherla in Kingston. I met my husband when he came to UE to study. He was born in England to Vincentian parents and lived there for 12 years before his parents returned to St. Vincent. He's a Vincentian Indian, but it was at this point that I realized, I realized that I was teaching him about his own Indian culture. I knew more about the traditions of India than he did. He grew up in the UK and his identity was Caribbean British. It may be a touchy subject, but Caribbean Indians at the time wanted to be associated with the Caribbean because there were many prejudices against Southeast Asians in the UK. At the time, nobody wanted to be associated with the Paki or the Indian. It was a matter of stripping away the ethnic layers and to be seen as British. What this caused, of course, was a disconnect between place of birth and ancestral ties. There was a major identity crisis as there was no box for the Indo-Caribbean person. Ethnically, it would be the Indian box, but culturally, they most likely would align with the Black Caribbean box. We tried to integrate some elements of both cultures into our wedding, including a Taj Mahal pin and wearing a salwar kameez and kurti. Later, later, we made sure to give our son a few Indian names. But such was a disconnect that when we said his name was to be Ravi, my sister-in-law thought we were naming our son after the Rav or SUV. I still had so many unanswered questions in terms of my Indian heritage. Why didn't I have any remnants of Indian culture in my family? When did my ancestors arrive in Jamaica? Why was there no effort to retain traditions? In order to be scientific, I decided to do a series of DNA tests. Each company gave a slightly different result and each had its own strength. Ancestry is good for finding relatives as it has the largest database. 23andMe is good for tracing routes, giving timelines and linking groups regionally. FTDNA is expert if you want to trace your direct MTDNA or YDNA. Living DNA is really good if you want to narrow down to specific ethnic groups. My heritage zeroes in on European roots, but it also has other good tools. GEDmatch is not a DNA testing company, but it uses your raw data to match you with family from all the other companies. There is no large Indian database in any of these companies, and most of them do not narrow down to specific ethnic Indian groups. It turns out that I'm a mongrel. I say this with much love and affection because like the Jamaica Brown, AKA Caribbean Terrier, I feel that mongrels are resilient, loyal, and unique. I feel lucky that I was born in Jamaica where I am not required to tick a box where I'm free to embrace all of my heritage. In terms of my Indian heritage, the DNA results pointed mainly to South India and Sri Lanka. One pointed to East India, now Bangladesh. Our Indian, Ata Samao DNA connections are from Tamil Nadu or Kerala. So I speculate that this is where part of the family originates, at least in more recent times. Or why DNA paternal line points the other way, closer to Balakistan near the Iran-Pakistan border. Having done all these tests, my main dilemma was now, who would I cheer for in cricket? West Indies, of course, but then should I cheer for India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh? I would love to have a more comprehensive conversation about how one can use DNA findings and records. Perhaps this can be the topic of a future meeting. I continued with my investigations to find my ancestors and this is where many questions were answered. My great-great-grandfather was baptized in 1845 in Prince of Wales Island, Bengal, now Penang, Malaysia. The only trace of a name of Indian origin was on this record. So today I would like to pay homage to Ram Suram, 
and raw menu. Samuel told his fam family that he was from the area of India that was now Pakistan. Based on the years in the mid 1800s, that could have either been the Punjab area, West Pakistan, now Pakistan, or the East Bengal, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh area. After many years of research, I found out that my ancestors were both Roman Catholic Indians. Samuel and Louisa were married in St. Annie's Church in Kingston in 1875. They were both recorded as both coolies resident in Jamaica. So the reason why we did not have the traditional Indian rituals was because as Christians, my four parents would not have had the same Hindu or Islamic celebrations as most of the indentured laborers who arrived in Jamaica. They did not come to Jamaica on the indentureship program. They entered Jamaica via the UK and thus they did not work on plantations or form the same bonds as other Indian families. There were shopkeepers and had lands in halfway tree area of St. Andrew. They were Indian, but not typically Indian. And I say this loosely because we know that India has diverse cultures, but religion has a huge role to play in culture and identity. In short, my Indian family was a minority within a minority. They simply became Jamaican. Where do we go from here? Jamaica does not have many temples and mosques. It is a treat to go to a traditional Indian wedding and to be able to celebrate the culture is something that is greatly anticipated. Some popular activities include the Roti Festival, Indian Arrival Day celebrations and Diwali. There is no store where we can go and pick up Indian clothes. If we want a sari, we have to buy online. For my wedding, my mom and I traveled to Shaguanas in Trinidad and Tobago and bought yards and yards of glorious fabrics and trimmings along with Diaz for the reception. Luckily, there are many online sources that help to engender connection with Indian culture. These are some of the Facebook pages that have a specific Jamaican focus. Musical journey from Indian Bharat to Jamaica. Excellent, not just for music, but for culture in general. Indian Jamaica genealogy, where people can discuss surnames and um, locations within Jamaica. Indian Cultural Society in Jamaica that highlights events that are happening. Jamaican Indian heritage, which pulls everything together, Indians and mixed Indians in Jamaica and the world. There is also a weekly radio program that combines music, culture, and information. These things are improving thanks to these radio programs and social media pages. I do see more Jamaicans taking an interest in their Jamaican culture. The Indian High Commission is dedicated to cultural education. For years pre-COVID, there were free yoga classes. The classes were well attended by both Indians and Jamaicans of all ethnicities. I still do these classes online with our teacher Gopalji, who is back in India. Our present Indian High Commissioner, His Excellency in Masakur, is incredibly passionate about highlighting his culture. This year alone, we have had dance concerts from his native state of Manipur, followed by a wonderful Bollywood extravaganza. These events not only showcase Indian culture, but are a way of encouraging Jamaicans to understand the richness of Indian culture as a whole. The events were well received to full houses. There is now a beautiful mural dedicated to Indo-Jamaicans in Kingston's art district. It may not be totally Indo-Jamaican, but it is a start and visibility is important. All is not smooth sailing, however. I do need to mention a disconnect between our Indo Jamaicans and Indians who arrived on the island in the last 20 to 30 years. Many do not have the interest or patience to teach those who are already here about Indian culture. The great majority of our Indo Jamaicans live in poverty, and tertiary education is still a dream for many. There is a level of disdain towards them, and sometimes our local Indian population sees even less of an impetus to learn more about Indian culture. There is a desire to simply be Jamaican, to assimilate and live quietly. Most of the original Indians have intermarried and it is hard, it's getting hard to find 100% Indian Jamaicans now. Large numbers have also migrated and as the numbers dwindle, so do the traditions. The heavy handedness of fundamental Christianity has also greatly dampened the desire to learn about religious traditions. Indian Hindu traditions are seen as devil worship, idolatry and the mark of the uneducated and Islamic traditions are eyed with suspicion. These are issues that need to be addressed to ensure that traditions are maintained and passed on to the future generations. Last year in the USA, there was a celebration of Indo-Jamaican culture. The theme sums up the situation perfect. 
we they are still we are still here this shows the need to be visible and to show the world that the culture is still alive in closing i want to encourage all my fellow jamaicans especially those of indian descent to be proud of who they are Find out who you are and where you came from. Start with what you know and set up a family tree on familysearch.org. Look for the records there, then take that DNA test. Test your elders and please document their stories. Don't be afraid to stand out just because you're in the minority. Go to the temples and mosques. Wear your bindi, your hijab, put on the henna, donna sari, play those bhajans. Embrace it all and celebrate it all. Be as Indian and as Jamaican as you want to be. The truth is the river will always find its path and the soul of India will begin to flow from deep, deep within. The answer to the question, who am I, is this. I identify as Jamaican first and foremost, then Caribbean. My ethnic makeup is part and parcel of who I am. I cannot ignore the myriad of cultures that came together to create me. Our motto in Jamaica is out of many one people and that is how I feel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. Excellent advice there at the end. I'll take very quickly uh, the question from Mr. Michael Tapu. Go ahead, please. I think he's trying to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack in what um what Shani spoke about and um as a jamaican myself who who've left jamaica for a number of years now but who go back very often i do have some some a lot thoughts on what she said but for most among them i i would say i appreciate that she she did an excellent job in presenting um an upbeat um perspective of 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 indianness in jamaica and um an Indian, you know, cultural norms or, or, or practices that may have survived or, or optimism about the future of that. But I, I'm, I, I don't. I, um, I, um, I have a somewhat different perspective of how Indians are perceived in Jamaica. I, I have gone very far in my life. So I've done pretty well. But um, so I'm speaking as someone who who um, perhaps can take a, a little more of a, a look away, away from being in the shell of it. And, um, and I, I do think that there is a lot of deep-seated um, prejudices in, in Jamaica against Indians there. And it has its, its basis. It's a bit of a hysteresis coming from the initial conditions that 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 prevailed in, in the in the Jamaica context, but not just Jamaica, in all the ex-colonial countries um, of England, where the Indians were brought in to essentially work for a cheaper wage, which the slaves, the ex-slaves, would not accept. And essentially they were perceived as, as therefore undermining the economic gains that the other group would have would have demanded. So that's a that's a common phenomenon. And the fact that they they worked diligently and, and for little or nothing in very difficult conditions. Um, the fact that they were not owned, but rather um, contracted and therefore could be exploited as much as possible for the five years or 10 years of their service without any worry by the planter that it's a, it's a property that he owned and needed to therefore treat with, with some level of sustainability for their gain. It, it, the, it, it goes missed. You know, and, uh, and, and the hysteresis of that is essentially at the core to me of prejudice against this group, which prevailed okay. and, and continues to prevail. So I, I have help. a lot of views on it. I, I know I'm going, to, I'm going to stop, but I, I, okay. I have a thought, lot of thoughts on these issues and we can come back to that. Either in this presentation or subsequently, but I, I can yeah. speak a little bit more on these issues um, at some other time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Duane, would you like to ask a question very quickly, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, not so much of a question, but I do agree with uh, Sharni, what she was saying that here in Belize, it's the same situation, more or less, is that most of the young people here 
like my age range or a little bit younger, they tend to not really want to know much about the Indianness, if this if that's even a word you want to say, or to go back in a sense of the Hindu, the the Hindu aspect of the culture. Um, they seem to have no interest in it. And when there are few of the elders here, primarily the Sindhis here, who try their best, they do have a little bit of Diwali functions and such, but they don't seem to be interested in wanting to learn more. We just know about our Husemise, Takare, food. There are some who eat meat, so we would be eating Takare chicken, things like this. And they would just say that is just the culture when there's way more. So I do agree with, with Sharni when she says that there's this, um, how you would say, gap with wanting to learn about the culture here. That we, we I humbly say that I'm the only young person I think of who is trying to get back to Sanatan Dharma. I don't know every, every single thing, but I'm learning from the elders who are also in the Sydney community and also from Trinidad and such. So, and through that way, I am trying my best to share with others, just like Charlene. And um, I think it was Amanda who said the same thing. She is doing her research. So as they say, each one teach one. And so I do recommend, I do, sorry, um, compliment what Sharni was saying. I commend. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Sharni, would you like to make any closing comments very quickly? Yeah, very quickly. Um, addressing Michael, Michael, I do understand because the feedback I'm getting from the Indian Jamaica genealogy group, we do have a lot of deep-seated um, pain about being Indian. As I said, I could not talk about that directly because this is not my context. This was not my experience for different reasons, but I have encouraged, I've been sending, begging, begging Indo-Jamaicans to speak in this forum and nobody has really taken me up on it. So hopefully, Michael, I will see you talk about these issues as, a, as an Indo-Jamaican. I would love to see more Jamaicans participating in this. I'm here almost every week, unless I'm traveling, I'm here. But, you know, and I send out invitations. So we just need to get more people on, on hand. Doing very quickly again, um, what is interesting is that non-Indo-Jamaicans are taking up the mantle and they're the ones learning to play the tabla. They're the ones learning to sing the bhajans. They're the ones learning how to make things that are Indian. So the culture continues, but it may not be continuing in the same way that you expect it to continue, but it's, it's, it's there. We just need to to foster it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad that you all are continuing the good work. Thanks so much, Shani. Let's hear again from Jamaica, and this is Anthony Badalu. Anthony was born and raised in rural Jamaica, but moved to England in 1985. In Jamaica, he participated in and played drums for the legendary Johnny Michael and the Raja Sarangi group. Anthony, please make a presentation short. If you could do less than 15 minutes, that would be terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, first of all, I have to say it, it's a privilege uh, to be speaking here. And I must say thanks to Dr. Kumar Mahabir and the team who, who organized these events and uh, Shamila Mohammed, who does a wonderful job to present it. So as the intro says, I was born in rural Jamaica and it's incredible to have three Jamaicans here tonight, and maybe more, I can't see on the screen. And uh, and one from my actual village. <laughs> so um, but that, that's amazing. Yeah, so uh, I, I was born in uh, Westmoreland, Jamaica, and grew up in the countryside, and uh, very much uh, like a free-range child um, with an incredible rich life with living close to nature. And we had, um, there was a lot of ceremonies, uh, and it was just natural uh, to me. and. Three of my grandparents are, came directly from India, um, but we have very sketchy information at the same time. I, I remember my father kept saying he's a here and he was very proud. I still until today don't know what, what an Ahir is. <laughs> and my, my grandfather saying he's from Judea and we still don't know what that means, uh, whether it's Ayodhya or is there somewhere called Judah in India? I've, I've, I've heard of it. but. Um, 
I know I'm Hindu and the name Badalu, it uh, means the blue people. We are from the, the lineage of Lord Krishna. And um, that's on my father's side, of course. My mom's side, I think they're Gujaratis, Tulsis, Salabis. Um, so we grew up with uh, some kind of inferiority complex because we were farming people and we didn't have a, a lot of modern facilities. Uh, but we were landowners, and, and that was quite a big deal. Um, so over time, my generation saw the transition from the, the farming uh, into the industrialized and commercial world and professional world. And it's been an incredible change. Um, I had the privilege that a couple of my older brothers, uh, Stedman, the late Stedman Badalu, had gone to Kingston and helped to establish the, the Prima Satsang group and the temple and stuff, which is still going today. And it's also a medical uh, place where people get free treatment. Dr. Winston Tolan and the Guyanese uh, Dr. Haim Prasad. And so I grew up, uh, Jamaica was uh, going through turbulent times in the 80s, late 70s. And uh, the, the black identity was coming to the fore. And Rastafarianism was, uh, you know, getting popular. And I didn't feel where I fit in because uh, it, it didn't seem um, to be so congruent. But in due time, I, I moved to Kingston and uh, I, I got to join a band uh, called uh, Johnny Michael and the Raja Sarangi group. We toured the island, played when we had a fabulous time and people treated us like, uh, like rock stars, but family at the same time. It was just such an incredible time. And um, in 1985, I left for a holiday to England. <laughs> which I still haven't returned on other than for holidays. So I had to start my life from nothing in England and uh, it was pretty tough. And um, the, the, there wasn't any connection uh, for Indian culture um, until about uh, um, maybe 10 years ago or so. And, there was Johnny Michael's two sons, uh, Philip and Trevor Michael, they're, they're in England and they do some um, gigs uh, sometimes. And there is, um, incredibly, my daughter went to Manchester University and she studied, uh, uh, what's that subject called where you study people? <laughs> but what, what are the modules on her course, which she was made to do was, a study of the Caribbean diaspora of Indian people. Um, so that was a quite, quite, quite amazing. It's on the curriculum in Manchester University, but we don't seem to have anything like that in Jamaica. Um, so, uh, yeah, and <clears throat> the, we weren't aware of the amount of contribution that Indian people made. And, and Indian people were Muslims and Hindus and different flavors. And even, even Jews, some of the Indians who came are Jewish. And um, now, now we're finding out they're from the Kashmir Jews and stuff. So um, when they say out of many one people, I guess <laughs> it does apply. Um, so we, we had um, quite a big change because in, in a couple of decades, I've seen the Indian weddings and ceremonies kind of disappear right down. But um, like uh, Shani was saying, it's coming back. I think it's the internet. My, my nieces and nephews who got married uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, they had Indian ceremonies. and. Um, I can see from Facebook um, a lot of things going on in Florida with Jamaican Indians. And I think the Jamaican Indian music, which we call Dinayad music, it's unique from all the other countries. And I think that should be preserved. <laughs> and 
I think it will preserve itself because I can see people trying to learn it and stuff and, and black people uh, trying to learn it, which is, is, you know, we had a guy called Bobby Maraj, who's a black guy playing with us. Um, he got some kind of award for culture or something. And this is for playing Indian music. So that's quite incredible. Um, so coming back into London, England, there is not a lot uh, going on, but there is some potential. You know, we got a great singer called Craig Passard. He's Jamaican, but he lives here. And he wants to do something. And we've got the Michael boys. And there's a young lad called Daniel Maraj. Um, his father was an English preacher and changed their names to Brown. And he has changed his name back to Maraj. And he wants to do something on the in Indian arrival, um, you know, some kind of celebration and stuff and, 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 and revive uh, something. So I've got a little YouTube channel called uh, Jamaican Indian Heritage, which we try to upload some uh, videos regarding, mainly regarding the culture and stuff and music. Um, I believe in the advent, just to conclude, uh, um, the advent of the internet, uh, like we're having today, it, it offers an amazing opportunity. And I think um, everybody's trying to survive and racism is not unique to us. Everybody faces racism wherever you are on the planet. Um, whether you're English, Irish, white, black, Jewish. Um, I've got a friend from Iraq and they face a lot of racism from the Shiite because they're another type of Muslim. And so it's just in the human DNA. I believe we just have to focus on the future, on the enjoyment, the richness. Um, we have such a depth on richness of life and philosophy and knowledge. Uh, Europeans are exploiting it like crazy. They're going back and, and coming out with, with some of the Indian practices and fasting and, and Sanskrit teaching. So um, we, it's about what we have to offer the planet and the world is in a crisis of identity, everybody. And we've got the best philosophy and wisdom to tap into. And uh, I hope we can project some of that and celebrate uh, the fact that we are in a position to, you know, to do uh, what many don't have the opportunity for. So thank you very much. Kevin, uh, sorry, Anthony, I love that point that you made that uh, the Europeans are exploiting Indian philosophy, making it into their own and marketing it. That is quite a good observation and it's true. And um, we're, we, we're sitting on it and we're, we, mm -hmm. we, we forget that we have, you know, I saw something beautiful, which I think is beautiful um, on the internet, reggae yoga. I mean, that, that's Jamaican Indian, you know. <laughs> Have you tried it, reggae yoga? <laughs> um, I might have tried it in my younger days uh, without realizing. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would love to see what that looks like. <laughs> All right, thank you so very much for sharing with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you two minutes if possible before we bring on our next speaker. Would you all like to ask any questions? Michael, this is your opportunity. This is your guy from your village, go ahead. <laughs> Get a laptop, man. No iPad. Yeah, he's having some difficulty there. And yeah, I'm using yeah, I'm using an iPad. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Anthony, it's nice to see you, man. You look so much like your brother. You have a brother named Michael, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you. I know Michael very well because he lived down. He lives down the road from where my parents live. I know so, the yeah. family. I know the family. Yeah. 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 My my. I appreciate your 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 optimism as well, <laughs> but you know, I tell you something. I, I'm not trying in these kinds of things. I've reached this point in my life where I don't really want to search for some to make to 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 get an appreciation for cultural practice and norm that I'm 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 not I'm I'm not really going to appreciate it if it doesn't come from a core or come from deep something that I grew up with. So even now, even though I 
I, I, I go to Mauritius, I spend six months there working for the government. And I'm, and they are very deeply religious and I, I truly admire the spirituality of their cultural norms there, perhaps because they have 70% Hindus. And I say that somewhat uh, anecdotally because they, it's a cultural practice that is stands in stark contrast to the, to the Caribbean, which, which, is more, which is less spiritual and more jump up and, and, and I just can't take that sort of thing. But my point really is I'm not searching for why you would worship a, someone a, a god that looks like an elephant yeah i'm not i'm not trying to search for that i'm not trying to to become an indian yeah, yeah? I, i'm trying i'm trying to understand where i come from and the people who came before me and what did they survive what 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 did they go through so i can learn the humility of my from my history as to what made them and that the small steps that they make, whether it be out of the one shilling, they save half of it, that small step, or whether or not they, they saved a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit, the small step that they made as they meet each crossword in their life for a betterment, how that, how that led to me and how that can guide my children as they also progress. And now, um, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm not looking to see whether or not my great grandparents were Brahmins. I mean, I have an idea that my the name Thakur was a Rajput or Kshatriya or whatever it's called. But but I never knew that until I went to study recently in, in more recently and 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 never bothered. But um, but I, so I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for understanding where they came from. What were the social and economic conditions prevailing in the 1840s to the 19, early 1900s that drove these people from these area to come, whether by, by deceit or, or in part or by, by choice in part. And that's what I'm looking for. So that's what I want to learn, to understand myself. I've moved away from, from I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't participate in Jose as a child. My father and great grandfather, they never did. I don't know why. Um, and, and so my father had an interest in Indianness, but my mother didn't, so we didn't have that. And I, I still believe that, you know, there is racism in Jamaica. I tried to make progress. And when you get tested at limits, you are reminded that you are just a coolie. I was. I applied for jobs there as a deputy governor. And the interview What's answered the question? the questions. What's the question, which are Mike? Very clearly, that this guy is saying, "No, no, you, you, you know, we, we can't." Yeah, Michael. Steve, that you could ever be in Michael. Patient. So, Mike, I mean, thank I'm you. That up because I know this is a public thing. So let me stop. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and you can always get in touch with Anthony, and you all could continue the conversation privately if you like. I hope you do, Anthony. Is there anything you want to say in closing, very quickly, please? Well, the, the, I was trying to get the question, but he, I think his, his, his question yeah. or my answer to him would be to say, whatever you need, whatever you're seeking, go forth and, and find it and then make your make your, your life a better life. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Nowadays, in the age of the internet, you can find out things a lot better and faster and uh, fill that gap. Right. So we so appreciate all that you've shared and that little bit of advice. And I hope you will get in touch with Michael and Charney and continue the conversation as well. So thank you so much. Jay, I'll uh, please ask you to just hold, hold a question until the end. I just want to bring on our final speaker. And this is Kevin Bardales of Belize. He's a lecturer in Belizean history at the University of Belize with a major in history and a minor in tourism. His mission is to retrieve the broken pieces of the past to recreate his family's history. Welcome, Kevin. Go ahead, please. You have 15 minutes. And that might bring us to the end of the program because at the moment we are at 4.47. We should be closing at five. Kevin, can you unmute, please? <clears throat> good day good day everybody thanks thank you for the opportunity to to present i'd like to thank 
um, Dr. Kumar Mahabir and the team for hosting me. My presentation today will be on the East Indian identity as it pertains to Belize. Now, I have grown up in Belize my whole life, um, lived partially in the States, um, but then I've always had this question, um, who am I? Am I, um, well, I know I'm mixed, but what do I, I, what do I identify as? And so through research, through, um, um, going to the Belize archives and through looking at family search, I have slowly began to piece together the puzzle of my own identity because growing up, I wasn't sure I would always um, respond to people and say, okay, I'm mixed with Spanish, but then from my dad's side, it's Spanish. And then from my mom's side, it is Richard's. And so I'll just, go through this presentation with a bit of historical context, um, what the East Indian identity is in Belize and what we are doing to justify our East Indian identity. So I'd like to start off with the 1857 rebellion, other words known as the sub Sapoy Rebellion. So in May 1857 to July 1859 was known as the first war of independence. This, as we know, began as a mutiny of the Sapoys of East India. Now the Sapoy soldiers were both Hindus and Muslims. And so by the conflict's end, the Sapoys were shipped away and about 3,000 Indians migrated to areas such as Jamaica and Belize. And this was sort of a punishment for the Indians. In 1872, you had an influx of Indians from Jamaica after their indentured contract was over. And then in 1890, you had a wave that came from Guatemala and these were people that were working in the coffee plantations. So these are two major, these are two major theories that the Indians came over from Jamaica and Guatemala and then eventually to Belize. So uh, as one could say, we were sort of the social dustbin of the Caribbean. Um, once you have finished your contract or your, indenter your indentorship, you would then come to Belize after it is over. You had two phases of migration. And these two phases of migration speaks to the Confederates migration to Belize. The Confederate migration to British Honduras was vis visible in two phases. The first phase lasted six years between 1861 and 1867. And mainly this was due in part by the political and social climate of British, British Honduras. In an attempt to seduce wavering immigrants, you had public pressure which forced landowners, including the Crown, to sell lands for more cheaper and acceptable prices. So again, the government of Belize or British Honduras at that time made a deal with the United States to sell, to sell them lands. You had one regular steamship communication with New Orleans and the other for the navigation to the Belize River. Now, talking about the Toledo settlement, it is important to note that it is located between the Rio Grande and the Mojo River, was the best known and was the most successful of the Confederate settlements. 
the community at this height comprised about 60% of the settlers. Now, Mr. Hatch, he was actually one of the first founders and he later on began to recruit people to come to British Honduras. So he was one of the first ex-Confederates to settle in British, sorry, in the Toledo district. But upon his death, um, Mr. Reverend, Mr. Reverend Pierce took over. And so basically what I have found in my research is that my great grandfather, which was Mr. Antonio Gentle, he actually, there is records that he got married on Fairview Settlement to Albina Richards in Peter Cleaver Church in 1930. And so there is a lot of research. Um, he actually worked on a plantation known as Forest Home and um, I would consider them to be third generation East Indians. Now, if you would look at the East Indians in Belize City, who are the Sandys, um, the Punjabs, they would tell you that you know, they are from another generation of East Indians. And again, as I would mention, there were three waves of East Indians. So um, again, um, so in conclusion, what are we doing to justify the missing history or the cultural practices of East Indians in Belize being an ethnic minority? As a lecturer at the University of Belize, I have moved on to create a club called the East Indian Club. I was very careful in creating this club because I thought to myself, I don't want to offend anyone. And so East Indian is, would be the safest thing to, to name the club. So again, Moving back to the waves of migration that we had in Belize, the East Indians in Belize are of a different, are of a different culture and heritage. So I was talking to um, an East Indian from that part of the city, and he actually told me that, okay, we do our practices. Um, such as the nine nights and so forth, but we don't do it um, as it, it is as it, as it's practiced in Trinidad and Guyana. And so I thought to myself, but why not? It is something that you should be proud of to practice, um, being that it is your religion. And so you have the National East Indian Council in Belize that they base their practices on the cultural food. Um, cultural dances, but they are still strict in certain things. Now I've made this East Indian club inclusive in that I'm saying, okay, we should bring in the tradition, bring in the traditional food such as the kuhun cabbage, the sano and so forth, but let's do a bit more. Let's do something different. And I've Really like to give a round of applause to Mr. Dwayne, who um, he has, he's slowly regaining um, the cultural practices. And I have included him as a member of my club. And so um, you have a couple members who are mixed East Indians, um, such as names such as Rancheran. Um, Miss Yudisha, she is the president of the club and so forth. But you're never going to find a full East Indian in Belize. Why? Because, because through intermarriage and so forth, you're never going to find a full East Indian. So if someone would come and ask me, you know, 
but you're not a fully Sinian club. But you yourself might not be fully Sinian. Okay, so let's work with what we have and let's try to do justice to history. So again, there's a lot of questions that I'm still piecing together as a historian. We don't even have a national East Indian Day in Belize. When did the East Indians actually arrive to Belize? You know, um, a theory is that they arrived on the steamship, the trade winds, but still there's no exact records of how they arrived. So <clears throat> thank you very much for this short presentation. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, good information for us. And I want to congratulate you on uh, starting that club and having it in operation. We have a question for you from uh, Charlene Maharaj. Charlene, go ahead, please. Do you want to unmute? One more time. Uh, hi, Sharma. Hi. Namaste, everyone. Thank you for this um, really deep, fulfilling set of discussions we've been having here. I don't know if to feel elated or daunted that we are, after four generations in the Caribbean, actually having to have these discussions, still struggling for some sort of space in each of the Caribbean islands that I've heard today. And so I'm having mixed emotions as I sit here. The presentation I, re I relate to the most is Shani, but I don't have a direct question per se. I, I want to point out to Anthony though that culture and identity is fast becoming an economic space and less a cultural and um, ethnic space. And that is the challenge, part of the challenge we in the Caribbean are facing in the sense that, in, in the sense that I am a lawyer and I identify whether I have silk. I am in a corporate space. I identify with um, the position I hold or the, the area I live in. And those are the concerns, and those are the challenges, sorry, that we face where cultural identity and ethnic identity is being replaced by economic identity. And it's, it's a big, big challenge. And in that way, when Anthony said, I think it was Anthony said that the Western world is taking over our culture and selling it back to us, it is because of that. It is now an economic space and not that I'm encouraging it, but unless we start to relate to it in that manner and probably reframe it, we will be, we will be pushed out of it in, in the name of the dollar. So that, that is my contribution at the end uh, today. And it's something for us to consider. How do we reframe it and make culture culture again? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Charlene. Um, Satya Dutt, you have a question or comment for Kevin Bardales? Please unmute. Try it one more time, please. Uh, the host has asked you to yes, start. Um, we can hear you now. Uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, okay. Okay. So are you there? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very interesting to uh, now hear all these uh, speakers on uh, identity. I'm Satya Dutt from New Zealand. My uh, heritage is um, Fijian Indian, and I'm living in uh, New Zealand uh, for the last 23 years. So identity is, in fact, a great um, thing that uh, we are looking over here in uh, New Zealand as well. And this is like um, not only you know isolated uh, case, but like uh, it's uh, happening all over the uh, world. And um, um, I, I think that the language plays a very vital role in the identity. 
and um, we should uh, actually um, focus um, on languages and associate strongly with our identity together with our culture. And, uh, and that's very important. That's what I really wanted to comment. I think I will come later in, in following a, a presentation to present about uh, language and its uh, impact on our identity as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Michael? It's a quick um, point for my colleague who just spoke um, um, about Belize. I, I, I appreciate the, the presentation, but I wanted to just say, I was reading, um, I believe last night or two nights ago, a, a, a book which, um, which really set out um, a little bit of the transfer of Indians from Jamaica and other colonies to Belize um, and Guatemala actually. So the, 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 the inflow that you saw from Guatemala may actually have been originally from another colony that, that went to Guatemala and then they left Guatemala and went to Belize. So I, I, I will look up that information, the source and, and send it on to you if you could just reach out to me. Thanks. Kevin, did you want to reply or? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Let's take Roseanne. Can hi, go ahead, please. Dr. Kanhai, please unmute. One more time. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So I have a question that I'm not quite sure how to frame because I'm not sure what the question is, but it's something that I'm just reflecting on. So um, the ICC, you know, have been running these sessions for quite a long period of time. And you have, I think, over 170 sessions, right? Which, you know, you mentioned. And I'm wondering if what is emerging here is maybe an epistemology or an ontology that is coming from Indians who are living in different parts of the world that is distinct and definable as different from other ideologies. For example, um, Jay Nair has talked about the philosophy of discovery. You discover something, you can pillage and plunder or whatever. That is an ideology, that is a way of thinking, right? Um, what, what is our way of thinking? India developed its own way of thinking through thousands of years. It's very philosophical. Other philosophy has been related to spiritual and cultural practices, okay? Um, some of those spiritual and cultural practices did come to different parts of the world. How much of the philosophies came and how have those philosophies been transformed? Uh, one of the, I don't remember her name, but spoke about uh, our, our identity is now becoming professional. I'm a lawyer. That, that is very important, right? I, I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. I'm saying everything is correct, everything is right. I'm saying, can we at this point, after these all these sessions that we have had and all the thinking we have been doing, can we somehow define and distill a philosophy that is coming from a group that has been in a minority status in most of the countries where they are, and what is that philosophy? Is that something we offer to ourselves or we offer to the world? Is, is something happening here that we can draw on all the sessions we've had to see patterns emerging and ways of thinking emerging? Anyone can answer or not answer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how, to, know how to ask a question, but um, there I put it on the table for reflection. <laughs> Dr. Kanhai, as always, you bring these critical questions which require such in-depth thought. And I would like to hope that some uh, students who are possibly in humanities will at some point look at all the YouTube videos, pull the information together and um, 
perhaps come up with that philosophy that you are searching for. At this point in time, I'm not too sure if we can give you an answer. I, I, in fact, I don't think you're looking for a, a, an answer at this point in time, but to stimulate some thought and that you indeed have. So thank you so very much. Albert, did you want to say something? So, so that's a whole uh, topic yeah. for a, a whole program. So we have, it's past five, so yeah. we'll have to close now. Um, Michael, maybe some other time. Um, but good, good, good point, Rosanne. And we will have to do a reflection someday on these uh, programs that we have been having over three years. But I just got an email, quite by coincidence. I don't know, uh, Shalima, I copied you on it. Um, uh, Afro Caribbean professor in England at some university said that she is using our webinars because all are recorded on YouTube in the course that she's teaching on slavery. So that just, just last week, we get all kinds of responses, most of them good. The others are suggestions and so on, but they all, we are providing a resource to begin with. And this, all these recordings are on YouTube and they are instructional. Uh, people can use them as resources, as uh, um, um, Dr. Hussein, what's her first name again? Had said, Gabriel. Gabriel Hussein, this is a gold mine of research material. So we'll have to end here. Sorry, Michael. Sorry, Albert. Sorry, Jay, we are past our time. Shalima, over to you. No, I'll turn it over to our chair, Sharia, and I want to say thank you so very much to all of our speakers today. And those of you all who, who brought questions and comments, we really appreciate them. We'll see you next time. Uh, same place. Thank you so very much. Sharia, over to you. Yes, thank you, Shalima. You're being a great moderator as always. And thank you all for taking the time today to attend and participate. As I said earlier, this is a public meeting hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. And feel free to contact the ICC to publish your own books and reports. Also remember, we're kindly asking you to give us your suggestions as well as a donation. Please contact Dr. Mahabir for details about this. Thanks to the advisory um, and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir. Thanks to our IT manager behind the scenes, Robin Ramsing. He has been recording the program and we will upload it uh, to our website and to YouTube permanently for posterity. And also thank you to Mariam Mohammed for producing our TikTok videos. Our topic next Sunday will be the historic and iconic temple in the sea in Trinidad in the Caribbean. Please visit our YouTube channel to see all our past recordings. I'm Ashiria Andrud from the Netherlands saying goodbye. May God bless you all. And you're at. So great thanks to all of you for coming and joining from all parts of the world for making the sacrifice and the time. And um, we are, Shalima, um, 